Chapter 4, Advanced Process Modeling. In this chapter, we discuss more on rework and repetition. We also discuss the handling of events and exceptions. Furthermore, we see how business rules can be integrated and represented in business process models. We are still concerned with the process discovery phase of the BPM lifecycle. The goal of process discovery is to come up with an as-is process model. In this book, we use BPMN to represent these process models. Chapter 4, Section 1. More on rework and repetition. Let's start with the example of a process that we have seen earlier. It's the example of a ministerial inquiry. Part of that process can be repeated. You see this part highlighted in red here. There is an XOR join at the entrance of this loop. And there is an XOR split as an exit point. If the response is approved, the process terminates. If the response is not approved, we repeat the part that is highlighted in red. This loop is a special loop. It is a loop that is a so-called single entry, single exit fragment. This means there is one unique way to enter this loop and there is one unique way to exit it. This is a very common way of representing loops, but it is not the only one. If a loop is of that structure, it brings the advantage that we can use various techniques for using subprocesses for representing it. Here you see how BPMN can support representing this loop as a subprocess. You see that the repeating part is now represented by an activity that is called finalize ministerial response. The fact that this can be repeated is indicated by this backward pointing arc shown next to the plus sign at the bottom of this activity. The condition that exits this loop is shown as an annotation and it says until a response is approved. The body of the loop, that is the activity sequence that is meant to be repeated, is shown as a separate sub-process below. You see here that at the end of this passage, a decision has to be taken if we repeat or not. And that decision depends on the condition that is formulated as an annotation of the superordinate activity. Loops can be collapsed to such subprocesses if there are a single entry and a single exit component. There are many loops that are actually not of that kind. Some of them have arbitrary cycles. This means they are unstructured. They have several entry and several exit points. You see such an example here. This loop has two entry points and two exit points. Sometimes it is possible to rework the loop in such a way that it becomes a single entry and a single exit. If that's not the case, we cannot represent it as a subprocess. So far, we have looked at examples in which the repetition is done in a sequential way. There are also other examples. Have a look at this procurement process. 
In procurement, typically a quote is to be obtained from all preferred suppliers. Let's assume here that we have five preferred suppliers. After all quotes are received, they are evaluated and the best quote is selected. The corresponding purchase order is then placed. It is possible to represent this behavior using the AND split and join gateways that we already know. We see a proposal here. Potentially, we could represent that after the AND split, we in parallel obtain quotes from suppliers A, B, C, D and E. However, this has several disadvantages. This process model is not very flexible. If there is a sixth preferred partner, we have to change the model. The model is also not very flexible in describing the behavior in a compact way. We have essentially five times the same activity being shown here. There's a smarter way of representing this behavior using so-called multi-instance activities. We see here the example how multi-instance activities can be represented in DDMN. The big procurement process that we had seen is now shown as one single activity in a quite compact way, followed by the quote and the placement of the purchase order. If you look carefully, you would see that the obtain quote activity comes with some annotations. We see that next to the plus sign, there are three stripes. These three stripes indicate that this is a multi-instance activity. That means we obtain the quote, not for a single supplier, but for a list of suppliers. The annotation on this activity indicates for each supplier. That means we obtain a quote for each supplier that is in a list of suppliers. In this way, we can very compactly represent that this is several quotes that we want to obtain. The cardinality is not explicitly shown here. It says for each supplier. We might also want to represent that we want to obtain a quote from 5 out of 10 suppliers. Also this can be represented. Let's have a look at a more complex example. Remember the order to cash process that we used in various examples earlier. Here a similar line of reasoning can be applied. We interact with a customer and we interact with suppliers. We need to interact with the suppliers when we want to obtain raw materials. You see here corresponding message flows being annotated. We can now observe that the customer triggers the process by placing a purchase order. Potentially that leads us into the path where we acquire raw materials. We see that, that there is an activity to purchase raw materials from supplier. Not all materials come from one single supplier. This is the reason why we have now indicated that we may want to purchase several supplies with several suppliers. You see the three stripes are put onto the activity purchase raw materials from suppliers. Furthermore, also the pool of suppliers now has these three stripes. That means the multiple instance markers can not only be used for activities alone. They can be used for pools, but they can also be used for information objects. 
you see here that a supplier's list is used for the purchase raw materials from supplier activity. And you also see that the list of raw materials is being used to support the manufacturer product activity. Both of them carry the multi-instance mark. Sometimes we do not know how often certain activities are executed. Potentially more often, but potentially they are also left out. If we have only limited knowledge which activities are executed and how often, we might want to represent that with so-called ad hoc sub-processes. You see an example here. An order placement is needed and we place a purchase order. You see that the control flow then leads to the ad hoc sub-process, which is indicated with the tile symbol. There are three activities that are inside this ad hoc sub-process. Check order status, update details, and cancel order with the corresponding sub-process. We execute any of these activities until the order is paid. Mind that it may be required to check the order status several times and also to update details. We do not know how often we have to check. For this reason, we use the ad hoc sub-process to indicate which activities could be relevant without explicitly showing in which order and how often they are used. 